Hello there, viewers. I'm glad to see you. My name is Mart Sonik and I'm the lecturer of Baltic Film and Media School and host uh, for the good, nice uh, event, w we can say. <laughs> it's a Digi Edu Hack, what means Digital Educational Hackathon. And today we have a more concrete webinar <clears throat> as a second one because we're unlocking the potential of digital education and exploring the European digital education action plan, maybe more on the local level, on the strategic level, on the educational level, let's see. But anyway, you have the possibility to join with us, not only as a viewers, but uh, you, you, can, you can write also the uh, questions. And you can find the link uh, under the YouTube channel named Slido. You can write there, you don't need to log in and we can see all the questions. We ask it during the interviews or maybe later uh, in the session, ask me anything. European Commission is supporting us. Thank you so much. And let's start. We have the wonderful guests here. Um, hello. And can you please introduce yourself? Hello. My name is Piedad Tolmos. I come from Spain, from Madrid. And uh, well, I'm really, really happy to be here, of course, and to take uh, this opportunity to, to share with, with all the people is viewing us and with all of you. Uh, I am a researcher at the university, at Rey Juan Carlos University in, in Madrid. And my research topics are uh, focused on mathematical education, STEAM education. And uh, well, also I want to say that I have uh, four, four children, so I am a little uh, expert You understand in how the learning process goes on, yes, yeah, yes, not yes. only as a teacher, but also, <laughs> but as, also a as a mother. Yeah, wonderful. We can talk about it later. That. Uh, how you implement it at home as well, <laughs> if it is possible, <laughs> if it is possible. Uh, but before I give the uh, word uh, <clears throat> uh, for you, Branko, uh, I, I need to clarify for the viewers as well, what does it mean a STEAM? STEAM uh, means science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics. Sometimes arts are so not it included is possible in STEM. To put them together, yeah. Yes. Let's speak yes, about yes. it later. Uh, Branko Angel, uh, can you introduce yourself as well, please? Thank you very much. At first, it's a great honor to be uh, with you here today in such a beautiful uh, event. I'm Branko Angic. I'm researcher at University of Hannes Kepler in Linz in Austria. My field of research is uh, using digital technologies as scaffolding tools in inclusive STEAM education. I would like to add a little bit more STEAM in this uh, uh, acronym. So there is several observation what A in the STEAM uh, could be considered. For someone it's art, but for someone it's more uh, uh, broader point of view. So it could be a architecture, uh, history, culture and yes. any other uh, things, not mm -hmm. exclusively some specific sort of the of the arts. And before we proceed further, I would like to express my compliment to uh, Tallinn University, uh, you Janika so and Sirli for a very professional and very nice organization. Thank you yes, all yes. more time. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, the little bit more about this theme. Why this arts came into? Not only because the anagram of STEAM is yeah. beautiful then as a word and we can remember it. There is some, some points more. You, you told about architecture, uh, history, something soft is coming into the technology, isn't uh, it? That's, that's the point, exactly the point. Yes, we know that is, everything is related and art, uh, to introduce art in this uh, general world, like, my, like Branko said, including history, uh, philosophy, uh, music, and of course architecture and arts in the um, city or uh, whatever, is, is, uh, is the point to, to include all, all the things in, in one. 
So to relate with science, with to technology, and to make it them more attractive to, because everything is related. Um. Actually, when we are talking about the arts, there is art by itself like a field, but also there is a pedagogy in teaching and learning uh, any other subject with uh, artistic approaches. So I remember when I was in school, and I believe everyone who is watching this, even if it's not like art uh, class, we were supposed to uh, draw something, to uh, scratch something, to pr create PowerPoint presentation. So actually that is everyday usability of art. So actually I think the art was always part of the STEM, but we just uh, maybe a little bit more clearly put it in that, uh, yes. that abbreviation. So from my point of view, uh, even if we are dealing with uh, science, with mathematics, engineering, I think art is not separable. For example, even now when we are talking, the talking and preparing all of this uh, hackathon is actually art. From this place where we are sitting, arranging decoration in the studio, the colors in the screen, all that is related with art. So I think art is really important. Art, which brings creativity, is also really important. The creativity part. is very, the creativity very important is word yes. here, yes. I think. Yes. Yeah, because yes. then we do something new. We yes. can mm -hmm. Everything springs from creativity. Yeah. So I think that's something which art brings, generally in education, not only to, uh, to the STEAM education. Yes, yes. I think that is, uh, the, the main methodology in STEAM education is the project-based learning or problem-based learning. So in real life, when you have to face a problem and when you have to solve, you know that uh, everything is related in this problem. So to solve this, you have to take into account not only your your science uh, point of view or your math, but also the your creativity, yes, yes, the possibility the environment. to and involvement, probably, yes, also, yes, yes, to yes. important stakeholders. Mm -hmm to get something new, what is really important for the society. Uh, but what are the main challenges, let's say, and, uh, and opportunities in the digit digital education overall? As we have the, it's kind of the first question. <laughs> <laughs> when we are yeah. talking about obstacles or problems in digital education, we, it always depends from which point we are observing it. Uh, I was born and raised in Montenegro, which is a developing country, but I work and I live in Austria, which is a developed country. So in uh, underdeveloped country, in country under development, there is a first uh, accessibility of technologies. Uh, there is a lot of schools, especially in the rural area, which are still uh, not enough equipped with digital technologies, with uh, 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 limited access to internet, with access to the internet who is with limited uh, they are speed. not technically ready yeah yes so that's yes but i think elementary. it's not only uh, situation in montenegro there is other countries i even think in the uh, developed country in the rural area which are facing yes. the same uh, the same uh, problems and i think the next step when we are uh, overcoming this uh, technical equipping the schools with the uh, with technologies then we are coming to the human factor its strategy, teacher training, and also developing concrete uh, teaching and learning media for digital edu uh, education. I think uh, a lot of technologies uh, which are used in uh, education are not developed with a specific purpose uh, to be used in education. So I think the research and trials in the school, how those technology could be used uh, in education can provide the feedback for developers and companies who are producing uh, those technologies, how to adjust it uh, for educational uh, purposes. Just one example, uh, for example, uh, interactive whiteboards mm -hmm. are something which was considered uh, uh, as a big educational technology innovation, but implementation in the school wasn't so smooth, even the school equipped with physical and digital object. There were a lot of obstacles because the software and uh, adaptation for educational purposes well, was not developed enough. So I think the hackathons and educational research and things who are discussing these uh, topics are of crucial importance because they are providing a feedback to developers and companies who are dealing with producing digital technologies, how to create a product for uh, educational purposes in schools, universities. 
that's a very good example because I tried it as well once and when I failed then I then I don't want to try it again yes this is also the, some kind of the problem that uh, Maybe I need to have the feedback from the developers that uh, it's now better running and, and better ready. But if I ask uh, from you that uh, what are the possible, let's say, the problems or opportunities in the digital education that you can add? Um, I agree with, with Branko because we have to, I think we have to focus now in the human factor, the pre-service teachers training, after the te technical readiness, of course. Yeah, the yes. Technical readiness and then the teachers. Yes. Uh, then yeah. now I think that yeah. we are in this in this moment that we have to, to take into account the, this human factor. Of course, the in-service teachers also to make uh, them evolve this, this feeling you have mentioned about your, you are a, a bit threatened of, of these uh, technologi technological uses. We have to, to deal with this with, uh, when we were in the pandemic situation because uh, many teachers couldn't um, uh, face this, this, this situation and they couldn't do anything. They want to, they want to, to go over to, to teach their students, but they, they couldn't because they, don't, they didn't know how many of them, and they were afraid about how of to course, do it. Of yes, yes. Maybe we need to mentor them, maybe we need to give them some tools, maybe some experience, yes. positive experience, before they start. Otherwise they start mm. and they feel that I they think, fail. Yes, yes. Yeah? I think it was, that was an opportunity to, to, to face that we have a problem, we have to, we have to solve this with this training and, and to overcome this, this... And to support later. Yes, yeah. yes. Something that I also consider as a big obstacle in using some of the digital technologies in education is also a quite rigid educational system, which are preventing fully expression, again, of creativity of teacher and uh, students. Just one example again, if a teacher wants to implement 3D printing and modeling in the classroom, if the class lasts between 45 uh, uh, minutes and one hour, it's from that time constraint impossible because it's technology who are requiring more time, more time to be, to be mm -hmm. used. So if teacher need to be stuck for that time limitation for one uh, class, then it's an extra obstacles uh, for them to use those technologies uh, in, in education. So I think the key actually by according to the many research the teachers are the main factor which are unlocking the door of, uh, for educational technologies and i think supporting the teachers by training train them then support them to uh, in implementation of phases like uh, with extra training consultation and as well with some kind of more freedom and more uh, support that they can create a lessons uh, not according to really limited uh, sched schedule in the school mm -hmm. will allow more applicability of digi the, the digital it's technology <laughs> digital technologies in education yeah, yeah. Mm. Yes, yes. yeah what do you think is there the huge gap between different schools we're talking about it's a uh, quite a fashion to talk about the gaps and it's quite true that we have the gaps in the different fields that um, uh, is there in the European countries uh, gap between uh, different schools in the digital education and the technologies. Yes, 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 I agree. But not only different schools, also different stages in the same school. That is surprising because they start, for example, in primary education with the digital education, using tools, using uh, apps or these uh, white uh, boards. Uh, and in the same school, they go to the, the next school, level the next and level, they can't. They stop. Okay. They stop. Because of the teachers or because yes. of the program or because of the... Hmm? I think there is a gap, but some of those gaps are not bad. For example, some of the vocational school which are schools, which are vocational schools, techni technical vocational schools, the technique obviously must be more implemented and used in those schools from 
opposite side, if it's like secondary sports school, it's obvious that technology should be a little bit less, uh, not excluded, but a little bit less represented mm -hmm. than in the school, uh, which is fully uh, technical. But I think uh, there is also the gap in the, in the same profile of the school in different parts of the countries and also in different, uh, as uh, you say, in different grades in the same in the same uh, mm. school. But I believe that each country and uh, politics and regulations are doing the best to adjust those uh, thing, uh, things in uh, graduate level from the uh, like little uh, usability of education in the first starting grades in the school that it's gradually increase in the uh, mm. later secondary upper uh, school. Yes, so upper. Think, yeah, upper it, even in at the university, I don't know if you are agree with me, but even at the university, we don't know, we don't really have a good re digital education. Uh, that depends also of the universities you are talking about. But I think I, I am talking from my point of view as a mathematician. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, yes, we are. We are not doing the things that the, the, they are the best things to prepare our students to the professional world. They are going to to be in when they finish their studies. Yes, we are. We are always teaching like um, twenty years ago, and we cannot do it anymore because we have the opportunity. We have the technology. We have the students uh, aware with this uh, this digital uh, world. This is surrounding them. They are living in it. So we have to take that, but that is, uh, the opportunity to 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 use this digital education and in every stages of the of the education from kindergarten to university, but including in university, I think. Yes, uh, I also agree, especially from university, who are educating perspective perspective teachers since they will educate further the younger younger generations. Yes. And I promised to ask that how it is to <laughs> implement it with your own family. <laughs> with Not only own. in the school only. Well, it's difficult to, uh, yes, because we, I have Are they for, interested about it? Yeah, yeah, you know, when you are at your own sons and daughters, it's like, no, no, mom, please don't tell me yes. about these math, math uh, freaky things you, you say, and this digital. No, well, yeah, they are interested in the, uh, any one of them in their own uh, field of attraction, because uh, perhaps the, the, my daughters are um, more attracted on the smartphones and the, the social, and the boys are more in the games, video games and digital, but they all for use uh, digital to digital tools in order to improve. And the, they grown up with it. Yes, yeah. yes. And use it uh, per perhaps later as well. Uh, thank you so much, dear guests. Uh, hope you see you soon again. And we have the short break now.
dear viewers, we will proceed. And we have the one new guest here. Hello. And uh, can you please introduce uh, yourself, uh, Luciano? Hello, Mart. Yeah, thank you. And um, thank you also for the organizers of the Giedu Hack and the European Commission for having us here today. Um, it's a beautiful day in Tallinn. Uh, I've been pretty much enjoying myself before this, so hopefully um, this will be a very insightful uh, session we have today. Um, my name is Luciano. Um, I am a researcher at Politecnico de Porto, um, where I uh, mostly research AI and how AI interacts with workforce development and education. Um, I'm also a previous winner of Digi Edu Hack 2020, so um, some experience will be shared today here, hopefully, so that um, any people wanting to participate on this Digi Edu Hack um, maybe get some insights. Um, and then also, uh, I have a startup that came out of Digi Edu Hack, so maybe that's also an interesting story to hear about. Of course, if uh, something happens and develops through it, and now you are the, I, I don't know, are you unicorn or not? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But, but anyway, uh, <laughs> you can deal with it and you can uh, have it as a bit as a job as well for the future. So, in the beginning, is the maybe the question about this. Uh, um, uh, this connection between the hackathon and this uh, digital education that how you could describe it yeah uh, so for me digital education um, is comprised of two or maybe three ways of seeing it especially uh, through the lens of this hackathon so the first one is um, that digital education is about skills about learning uh, digital skills um, and this is very important also it is a priority for the European Union um, and so that's why this is also very important on on a policy standpoint but that's for Georgie to talk about later um, the second point is that digital education is also about these new tools that we are getting um, for maybe innovating and making uh, something new in education. Uh, so for instance, AI, uh, or today we were talking a lot about um, robots also being, making it possible for people to be present, maybe remotely, but more as if they had a body. Um, so there's a lot of um, digital tools and technologies that can impact on education. So that's the second point of digital education. And then the third point I would say is a lot about um, inclusion. So how the digital can help us include maybe some groups that are, um, well, not being included that well right now. And that's more of Branco's expertise. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah, you can take the word, of yet. course. Uh, I'm a big uh, fan of uh, the Giedu Hacks and I watched your previous uh, uh, session or actually previous workshop. And I'm impressed. And I remember the uh, talk of a girl who won the last year, uh, yes. Hakuton Teresa, if I remember the name correctly. Correct, correct. Uh, and she uh, explained how uh, she felt full inclusion of her in as uh, a person from psychological educational background in a world of uh, digital uh, experts like programmers, uh, computer scientists. Yes, and she didn't expect it that this is possible. Yeah, yeah. but that's she didn't expect it. amazing showcase of uh, inclusion because she actually explained uh, how they respect uh, what she expressed, how they uh, reframe ideas and they polish their ideas and develop it uh, in collaborative uh, way. And I think that's the key point which digital technologies in those events bring to inclusive uh, inclusive uh, education. Thank you for mentioning uh, it. Uh, we had a several experience uh, to test how digital technologies are uh, uh, supporting inclusive uh, classroom and uh, beside what you've said, like uh, Luciano, uh, that it's developing digital and computational thing, uh, uh, skills, it also improves social 
uh, skills, uh, interaction between students with disability and students with, uh, without disabilities. So I think that's some it's really important part which digital uh, digital educational technologies bring into not only schools and education but generally into society and I think that's equally important not only uh, for us and as a researcher and educa educator but also for European Union and Commission uh, that that's also extra important things of digital technologies not on, on only digital skills and uh, computational thinking skills so that's that's really wonderful what technology is bringing to inclusive education this is absolutely true you know i had today the phone call uh, from the student who wants to start to learn the communications and journalism and su such of area and she asked in the in the end of the phone call that is it possible that the robots will take over our job uh, that is it have the perspective so uh, did you had any any uh, such of uh, also the misleading barriers or something like that not only the development uh, ideas from the from the people or from the society maybe afraid some i like that topic some days ago i saw one meme on the internet it was like when televisions appear it was television television will replace the teachers and then like two years later we are missing the teachers and then when innovation of computers was, were introduced it was like computers will totally replace the teacher and several days uh, later it like we are missing thousands of thousands of teachers now we are in the hype the artificial intelligence uh, will replace a teacher but at the same time uh, developed country like uh, Germany, Austria and Switzerland are facing a big uh, shortage of teachers, especially from field of STEAM, science, technology, engineering and uh, uh, art and mathematics. So I don't think the uh, technology will replace any of uh, professions, but I think it will improve those uh, professions and make us more efficient in the way which we are doing it in, on a daily uh, daily work. So, what's your uh, yeah your experience or yeah. thoughts I, also? You I can only second that. Um, and there's maybe a harsh truth that everyone has to face, which is that AI is probably here to stay um, because it does make our work um, way more efficient. Um, and it adds a lot of value, uh, so both uh, economically um, and also from my point of view. Um, it could even have a social uh, value. And what I mean by this is that um, basically until now we had um, people that, you know, could write good essays or not or do well in school or not. Um, and, uh, and also people that were excluded of certain areas of education because uh, basically they felt like they didn't have a chance to be part of that. And AI actually opens the, the door, the possibility for um, more people to become very skilled at certain tasks. Um, so for instance, if you are programming, um, it is true that you need the logic and you need to learn that logic and what it means to program. And that's why AI, by the way, is not replacing our jobs yet, right? Um, but the thing is, you can code with it. So if you have an idea, you can use AI GPT to code for you. And, and that, I think, is a very powerful tool because uh, we can be more, not that we can be more creative, but we can do more with our creativity now, um, which is a great example of use of basically digital in any aspect. So we don't need to afraid the hackathon, we don't need to afraid technology. And uh, you suggest to come yeah. and to try. So what, uh, what it is, uh, what we need to think before we are coming to the hackathon? Yeah, so... How we need to prepare it? Let's refocus this a little bit on the hackathon side. And uh, this is a very valid question. Um, I would say that a hackathon is all about what you want to give the world. You have basically 24 hours to be creative and do whatever you want with whoever you want. Um, and in these 24 hours, you have an amazing opportunity to come up with 
some solution to a challenge in digital education. So that's the three things I said before, basically. Um, and the important thing here is to think about what is the challenge? Uh, what's the challenge I want to solve? So maybe you can start with what's my story? What, why am I interested in education or in digital or in both? Um, then you can also go without any idea and just look for people that want to do something with you. That's also a great approach because, you know, not everyone... What you, what you made a better... How you made a, a world better place to live? What was your idea? <laughs> uh, so for me, it was a lot about this problem of the future of work. So I, I'm not sure if you are familiar with this, but technical skills um, on a high level right now um, go obsolete like every two and a half years to five years, which is really crazy if you think about it. Every five years, you basically have to reskill yourself completely. And so for me, there was this big, huge um, thing, which is skill gaps, right? So it is everything that a company or a society needs to succeed um, in their long-term goals, and then they don't have the skills for that, or not enough skills. And so it's changing so quickly. It changes so quickly. And so um, what we saw is that this is our challenge, or this is our opportunity to solve something. And so basically what we thought is, OK, if you can somehow close the skill gap by um, suggest, suggesting or recommending uh, courses and even projects or tasks to people to do and slowly um, build their skills up, um, that would be awesome. And so uh, basically because we close the skill gap, right? And uh, because the people get reskilled and feel more worth uh, and uh, they are autonomous in that learning. And so a lot of great things that, you know, are good for vocational training, but also at the turn, as it turns out for higher education, right? Because higher education, I think um, Piedad has seen that a lot probably, is a lot of people are afraid to go into maths, for instance. But what about if you have a learning path that is not actually all the courses you would normally take in maths, but it is courses that you are interested in, but that eventually lead you to have these skills in math. Um, and so that was our approach. And what we did is we built a recommender system. So we used AI to basically find uh, transferable skills uh, and make that possible to, for people to, well, uh, have this lifelong learning experience and constantly reskill and upskill. And so that's, that's, uh, that was our idea. That's very interesting. You want to, Branko, you want to comment a uh, bit uh, this possibility yes. to, to implement it into the educational system yes. as well? Yes, uh, I, I would divide this, those skills in two different groups, but in the real world it's one uh, compact uh, group of, of skills. One is technical skills, another are critical, critical thinking, communicational uh, skills and uh, social uh, skills in general. At the, for example, at the basis of my own experience, I won award as, uh, as the best robotic teacher, but my educational background is in Europe, uh, but my educational background is in biology. My award in European Open Competition, that was 2017, it wasn't because I was the best programmer in that uh, uh, in that competition, because there were uh, teachers who are specifically uh, trained to teach robotics. But I think it was because specific pedagogical value which I transferred to my uh, to you my students. You had also students. some idea how to uh, make a world better place to live. Yeah, I, 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 I tr I'm trying, yeah. and actually, I think that mind openness and giving a chance to everyone, uh, it's also equally important as digital uh, digital skills. Also, at the basis of my uh, experience we, in Linz, we are doing a lot of about using different technologies in inclusive uh, education. There is also opportunity to uh, uh, use uh, 3D printing and 3D modeling with the students with disability, which at the first look, look uh, really 
impossible. But if you give them a chance, if you communicate with them, the students with disability, with blindness, with cognitive uh, disabilities are able to participate in model development equally as the students without disabilities. And again, I will go to the story of Teresa, which is extremely inspiring. She's a psychologist with her skills. She was in the winning team uh, and winner of uh, previous hackathon, which is like impressive. So I think it's the digital skills are extremely important, but also the soft skills, which digital technology, usability of digital technology is developing are huge and they are equally important as, as, a, as a digital one. And I think using digital technologies for communication and gain the, all this skills and uh, knowledge are amazing and they are opening a door for a world to, uh, to be a better place for living. Wonderful. Maybe the one question is about this hackathon is that why we need to have the limited time? That's, uh, uh, and it's need to be limited by the 24 hours, not for the 48 or, or something, something else. Uh, why it is so, or <laughs> what is the benefit of it, let's see? Let's say, if I ask from you as a um, previous winner. That's, that's a really great question. And you can imagine it as um, you have 100 doors and um, there's 100 different prices behind those doors. Which door do you choose? Right? And so you choose one and then this guy comes along and says, well, um, there's actually a better price behind some of the other doors. And so um, you might be tempted to then go and try to change your doors, right? And the thing is, um, you will get overwhelmed by all the choices and probably make a bad choice, actually. And so with 24 hours, what you are doing is you're reducing that number of doors to, let's say, two. And then you have only 24 hours to really decide what you're doing you and need to make how a you're doing it. Exactly. This is the important and, thing. And this decision making, that is so crucial. Um, and also, by the way, this is so great to when you are being part of this, because you will learn a lot about decision making and it will prepare you a lot, uh, you know, for the future work or uh, startups or whatever. Um, but the main point is that you have these 24 hours because you have to come up with an iterative solution. So it will not be the best solution. Um, I always say MVP mindset, right? So it's a minimum viable product mindset. You just go and you are like, well, I want to solve this problem. Can I solve it with an Excel sheet? Okay, maybe you can. Okay, let's get the next step. I've tested that. Now I try to program an AI to do that, right? And so with these 24 hours, it makes you really have to be in this agile mindset and kind of go iteratively about it. And I think this is a very powerful tool to actually get something done. Um, and so after those 24 hours, you will have something, which um, if you think about it, most projects are very, very long and the outcome is often not so great. So these 24 hours really boil down the essence of your idea. So I guess it is a great um, way to do these kind of things with hackathons. If I may comment yes, on yeah, this also, I think these webinars are also really important uh, part of uh, uh, Edu, uh, Edu uh, hackathons because they are actually narrowing down direction for someone who is going in some of educational technologies or educational hackathons. Uh, as you say, if someone is start to Google it or search on internet uh, for something like digital technologies or similar, he will get he or she or they will get a lot of choices and they will be lost in that huge network of information. Long so articles, I, maybe. Yes, yeah. yes. And when they get like information in one place, like uh, University of Tallinn is doing with this Edu uh, uh, hackathons, it's extremely useful for someone who is interested to participate next year or something like that. Thank you so much, uh, dear guests. I uh, hope Thank to you. see you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, dear viewers, we're coming back soon.
Welcome back. Now the very important topic about the action plan, about really the details. What does it mean and how we can get on the better results? And I'm glad uh, to invite into the studio uh, through the digital bridge, <laughs> Georgi Dimitrov. Hello, Georgi. Can you hear us? Hi, Mark. Hi, everyone. I can hear you. Wonderful. So, um, what is the really the digital education action plan and how does it address the main challenges? Well, um, the digital education action plan is what you can call a flagship policy. So basically, this is the main priorities of the European Union in the field of digital education obviously. It uh, runs over a couple of years because it is very important that there is continuity and sustainability of policies. It is also uh, an integrated policy in the sense that uh, it addresses both questions around infrastructure, connectivity, devices, I mean the things which you would call uh, our hardware. But it also addresses things like the um, teacher digital skills, as well as, of course, the digital skills and competences of pupils and students. So it's kind of a well-rounded uh, policy, if you like. And uh, what is interesting about it um, is that um, it is the first uh, policy of its kind at EU level. Um, I'm, I'm just... Uh, Meaning by this that so far the European Commission has been dealing with different uh, bits and pieces, but now it does this in one full package, if you like. So I think that's it. It sounds really huge because we were talking about that there are the gaps even in the in the school themselves. In the one school, uh, there is a. Um, really gaps between the regions, between the, uh, the different uh, states. And these gaps are connected, as you said, with, uh, with the technical um, readiness and with the readiness of the teachers. What are these, let's say, these first two or first step of uh, these uh, two uh, different fields? Uh, if we talk about the readiness of technical aspect and if we talk the readiness of, uh, of teachers. What could be the first or two uh, steps? Well, um, I think that uh, you have to start with the basics and you have to start with the, um, what you probably call readiness. Um, indeed, a uh, very important topic. And uh, if you look nowadays at um, the number of schools in the European Union, and uh, there is lots of thousands of schools, as you can imagine, uh, there is only four out of ten, uh, in fact, that have a, a digital strategy. So um, this is not, uh, I would say, sufficient. Also, uh, if you look at the levels of um, connectivity, for example, what you can see is that uh, only one out of five schools in the European Union is connected uh, to a uh, network which is faster than 100 megabit. So basically, each of you and uh, me, including who have a smartphone connected to the 5G network, has a faster connectivity than, the, um, let's, let's say, the majority of schools. Um, so we have a lot of work to do there. But also, if you turn it on the other side, um, you, um, you also see that the level of digital skills in the European Union are not sufficiently advanced. And uh, your previous speakers uh, spoke about it. So let me just give you an example. Um, currently, we have only more or less one out of two uh, persons with basic digital skills. And these are really basic digital skills, which mean, I mean, essentially the um, usage of a browser to write an email, I mean, things like this. At the same time, it's much more advanced digital skills for the economy and for the society. And this is where some of the big uh, mismatches currently exist. And to your point about the regional differences, uh, absolutely true. It is clear that in the European Union, we have a very, very diverse picture from, um, let's say, country to country. But there are some commonalities as well, um, such as, for example, the fact that um, 
uh, in no, let's say, no single member state, we have sufficient um, ICT specialists. And also um, in many uh, member states, we still have some significant gaps that we need to cover in terms of the digital tools, you know, how teachers um, um, have uh, digital skills. That's also something we know from uh, studies. Uh, essentially, we know that only four out of 10 So there is a lot to do still. Then we can talk also about these recent developments. Do we have already gained something? Well, I, I always like uh, examples so I can tell you what, uh, what we did last year in order to support teachers, because I just said that uh, teachers are a very important part of the whole equation. So last year we uh, worked together with uh, expert groups to develop guidelines on how to address disinformation in education and training, and also how to use AI and data in education and training. And these are two sets of uh, very practical guidelines which are targeting teachers. So basically we are trying to give some more practical advice around the use of digital technology of more, more advanced kind of digital technology and uh, phenomena such as disinformation. Because we know that um, the world moves very, very fast and we also know that in, in many places continuous professional development is not covering uh, these kind of things. And I mean, if you think about AI and uh, what is happening in the last months, uh, you see a very, very nice example. So, so we, are, we are supporting this type of measures which can be concretely uh, useful for the member states and also for uh, teachers or for pupils. And uh, of course, I can, I can give you some other examples, but maybe I'll, I'll just leave it here. Yes, why not then? You can also tell uh, how I can find them, how I can find these uh, guidelines. Do I just can Google it uh, and uh, add the digital education or do I need to do something more? No, I, I think this is going to take you right there and you can do it in every language of the European Union. So you can do it in Estonian and you will be able to find the guidelines. Um, you sh should just insert something like the guidelines, teachers, disinformation and uh, European Commission or uh, guidelines, AI and uh, teachers, and then you will be able to retrieve them. So they are published uh, since last October. Uh, thank you so much. I will do it for sure. And I advise the other teachers as well, because there are a the lot of myths, a lot of disinformation, and uh, some of the teachers are really already kind of uh, afraid to use the essays as a possible <laughs> way to evaluate the students' knowledge. Um, how does the digital education hackathon fit with the digital education action plan? Okay, let's now get a bit more into the concrete part of it. Um, the hackathon is a great, great project which started uh, five years ago. And uh, in the first editions, uh, which means between 2019 and 21, it has grown to more than 200 hosting organizations, 600 solutions, and more than 6,000 participants. And all of this started just as an idea, and uh, it kind of became a bit of a snowball, and it grew. So our objective with continuing this is to reach even broadly the type of organizations, the, the different stakeholders who are there, and in fact, to even continue to grow this movement, if you like, because it's about also a certain kind of mindset. And uh, I think the speakers before me, they, they, they gave very nice thought on um, how you can get engaged and how you can contribute with your creativity, in fact, um, in, a, in something which is uh, purely bottom up or it's actually a user driven. And uh, this is what we also like that um, we see a lot of engagement from um, basically from the ground, from, from people who come up with their ideas. And uh, the action plan that I spoke about is providing a little bit of a hook to the, to the different categories that we have. For example, uh, this year in the um, uh, Sorry, in the, in the last year's team, people at the Center of Digital Education, 
we, we are linking this very clearly to the European Year of Skills, which we have for right now. So the 2023 is the European Year of Skills. And we focus on the importance of, um, you know, uh, technical skills, but also soft skills, creativity, cooperation, cooperation. Um, and, and so we try to link, if you like, the policy part uh, with the very, very practical project on the ground, which I think is uh, one of the very few projects which I have seen in my experience, which try to do that, if you like, from the very high level of abstraction of policy to the very practical results and to the 24 hour cycles that uh, people engage with, with these interactions with this kind of minimum products, with, uh, which uh, um, I think Luciano was talking about. And all of this is really um, one bit which aims at promoting the idea that everyone can do innovation in education, rather than waiting for it to happen from, you know, some uh, very wise person or from government or so on. So it's a little bit of... Um, power into the hands of everyone who wants to innovate in education. So it is also the kind of the involvement of society, let's say, that, uh, that not only the teachers, this is not only the question for the politicians and uh, for the teachers or for the policy makers in the ministries, but this is the, the, the education and the future of our children is the question for us. We can solve it somehow through this hackathon well i am a strong believer in the fact that uh, pupils and students and teachers so these are the people who are actually experiencing education i'm strongly uh, convinced that they should be a very important part of the innovation process because we cannot ask them to implement things which let's say which are away from the so, uh, they need to have the experience. Or, or yeah. Exactly. They, they bring in the experience when you ask them what is important to them. What would be your message to the digital education hackathon community? Well, I will say that, uh, first of all, uh, the efforts of the community can have a uh, real impact on education in the digital age. Um, connect, uh, creativity and expertise can help to address and solve the real challenges. Uh, we should also not forget that this is about uh, an idea and the implementation of the idea, and it's not about having the perfect technical solution. And we should also not forget that this is something where you get together with people from different backgrounds and uh, with different experiences, and you can get to learn quite a lot. So you need to stay uh, open to the journey and you have to, in a way, embrace this kind of experimentation. And there is no such thing like a setback or a failure. It's uh, just another opportunity to learn. And so I really encourage you to celebrate and to share the achievements. So do good and speak about it. That's a good advice. I need to ask it. Uh, do we have any unicorns already or is it possible to get rich with this project later on? <laughs> I don't know if it is possible to get rich with this project. Uh, the idea certainly is not to support uh, fast get rich schemes. But uh, I think that uh, as you have seen from um, the previous speakers, I mean, you see people who have taken an idea through an accelerator and they are creating their company. And so they go on this entrepreneurial journey. So only time will tell if this is going to be a unicorn or it's going to be a smaller company or something big, but, but there's definitely a very clear path also to the market. And this is also what we want to, to, to openly promote that um, it is also a way to apply your entrepreneurial skills. Thank you so much, Georgi Dimitrov, uh, and uh, to introduce for us uh, the Digital Educational Action Plan. Now is a time for the viewers to write the questions uh, 
whatever questions you have about the digital educational hackathon and overall about the digital education because after the 10 minutes we will start the session which calls ask me anything session and we're gonna ha have here the Luciano you've seen already Luciano previously and also the new guest Pirat Almas so see you soon
Hello, dear viewers. Welcome back. And thank you for the questions. So now is a session for you, not only for us. You already, already know our guests, uh, but we don't know you. So you can uh, write about yourself and you can ask any questions you just want to ask. And I'm glad to see that in the Slido, which um, link you can uh, find below under our um, video, uh, you don't need to log in, you just click on it and you can ask whatever you like. So, uh, Q&A session. <laughs> what is the uh, first question for you? First question is a compliment, as I said. You know, it is compliment. It started like that. Uh, because the viewer was listening to you carefully. And so he said, you have wide international experience. And this is not a question question will start. How do you see Europe's preparedness for the digital transformation in global comparison? It's uh, really the interesting inter question because uh, we have China, we have South America, we have Asia, we have everything. There is no Europe in the middle, maybe somewhere else is in the middle. Who wants to start? I can take that one. Um, and yeah, as they really said correctly, we have a very international a representation here today um, and so hopefully we will be able to somewhat respond to this question it is quite the difficult and nuanced question I would say um, but um, let's start off with something uh, that maybe all of you know we are right now in the twin transition so it is digital transition and green transition and those are the top two priorities of the European Commission now. Uh, so Europe is preparing for all of these um, changes that are inevitably taking place. Um, and just um, some weeks ago we actually passed the um, AI Act as well. So um, pieces are moving a little bit faster. There is some critique internationally, I would say, that we are um, maybe doing some impediment, impediments for AI um, in regards to um, data protection and so on. Uh, if we look at Americans and what the Chinese are doing, they obviously don't uh, have the same level of concern, let's call it, as we have. Um, but I think it is quite good that we have this approach because that guarantees that we have a way more ethical and thought through uh, technology and so um, there will be uh, enough input from policymakers I think in the next few months and years to put us on par with uh, the US which as you know right now are the key players in AI with GPT and all of that um, but don't make a mistake we do have a very big industry in AI uh, and we do know how to make things. And so um, I wouldn't worry about the, the economic situation of uh, yeah, uh, AI and technology in Europe. So the Europe can, can do and Europe have the capabilities to, um, to do? We definitely have them. Yes, yes. We are making from Europe and Commission a big effort in order to be prepared. And I think, I think we are. We can, we can face this, this new challenge. We are prepared to, and as Luciano says, uh, um, comparing with the, these two big uh, states and China. Uh, of course, we are not at the same <laughs> place in this moment, but we are preparing, we are ready, and we can uh, add another things, other 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 points of view that they are not uh, were too. As Luciano says about, for example, the, the rights and, for example, sustainability, they are not at so aware <laughs> like uh, European in in these points. So we think we can do it together. Yeah, I think there's one more nuance to this as well and. If you look carefully, um, all this change in, in AI, for instance, has come 
mostly from private companies. So it's mostly OpenAI and Google and, um, and Microsoft uh, who are fueling this advance. Um, and so, and this is maybe a little bit more scope than this question, but the bigger question is maybe, uh, and Ian Brenner gave a talk about that the other day, um, uh, is that maybe uh, if we talk about new order, how the world works, um, we are transitioning more and more into these kind of, um, well, big companies taking control of the digital. And the digital is one of the big, um, well, orders that we have in the world. And so I think from that perspective, it's quite good what the European Union is doing because it is about um, these private players, are they going to safeguard our interests or not? And so the European Union um, is going to put some stops there. And of course, maybe some private companies will have a harder time here um, innovating as fast as in the US. But at least we are guaranteeing um, that this innovation goes on par with our social values, which I think is very important. And, and so that's a little bit the nuance I would that's, uh, that's do here. That's a very, very uh, correct nuance, I think. So sometimes I think that uh, if uh, we, we have the different runners and uh, some of them uh, have some rules, example, they can't uh, wear the shoes, <laughs> <laughs> and they need to be run with the uh, naked legs, then maybe they have the different possibilities to get them to the finish. Um, but in the other hand, as you said, it is the uh, it is the it is based on our values, and so this product could be still fit uh, better. Yes. Example. Let's see. Let's see. Then we have some uh, questions. Uh, more is um, mm, that's about the post-COVID situation. Uh, post-COVID situation that uh, what is the most critical questions of digital education after the COVID period? I think that in my opinion in a uh, COVID situation face uh, to us uh, what is happening in, in digital education that we were not aware about this in my opinion and and also they bring us the opportunity to improve these these things we we notice in this in that moment and to bring us uh, some methodologies and some tools that uh, has uh, been stayed they, they 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 are now to be used with the, all the possibilities they, we didn't know in that moment so I think this is a good, it's a good uh, opportunity, as I said, and also to, in order to, to improve this, this, for example, this teaching education uh, in order teachers and also pre-service teachers, they are going to contribute to, to, to improve the education of our children, our future children and our, our actual children. These methodologies like um, this, uh, flipped learning or problem-based learning we, uh, we used in pandemic uh, times. Uh, the blended learning, the remote <coughs> learning, uh, opens to us a, a world of possibilities to, to share uh, our knowledge, to share our experience in different parts of the world. We can share uh, with our children in our class in, uh, in Madrid, uh, with children in Italy or with children in, in wherever. And this is an open world of possibilities. This uh, augmented reality, for example, 
we use it in, in pandemic situation. We, we didn't care about this when we are not in pandemic. We just use that university or higher levels, but we have the opportunity to show our children this world, and this is going to be here to stay. I think this is what Yeah, we so think. there is a, the people saw the opportunities, and then now uh, there is a demand on the field already. Yeah. That, uh, let's do something like that. I remember my students as well. They, they, uh, they started to ask. We have some flu period, uh, as in every way in Europe, some January, February, that maybe we can uh, do some lectures in the Zoom to avoid uh, sickness, possible yeah. sickness. Yeah. So uh, yeah. exactly, and uh, what Piedad said is uh, completely true. So COVID basically opened the floodgates to all new technology and methodology uh, in education and it all came a little bit chaotic but now it's starting to crystallize which tools might be really useful on the long run and which not and um, it's actually very interesting because we are right now in Tallinn and there's the uh, um, uh, an, an conference taking place right now about digital education um, and so there's been a lot of presentations here today about new technologies being implemented in the classroom. Um, and the interesting thing is um, you pose the question as what is the biggest, uh, let's say, problem or challenge? Challenge and, or question. Uh, or question, yeah. exactly. But I would say, as Piedad said, this was an opportunity. Um, and now the challenge is that demand and at the same time um, this very old question, which is um, the fear of new technology. So uh, professors and teachers being afraid of actually using this new technology and also not knowing which technology is here to stay or not. Um, and for that, the message is, um, and I think uh, Giorgi George, George also said that, is you just have to try. Um, and it's okay to fail because we are now in very uncharted territories uh, and we need to try things out. Um, and so my message to any teacher that is out there is, uh, I mean, just try because um, the other day we had here on the, on the webinar uh, some very interesting speaker as well, which uh, was Andreas from, I think, University of Frankfurt, if I'm not mistaken. And he... Uh, teaches, yes, computer sciences. Yes. Yeah, he yes. teaches computer scientist teachers how to yes. teach. Yeah. Um, and so he said, for instance, that they did a whole uh, comic book, kind of, just using GPT and, um, and some other generative AI tools like MindJourney or uh, things like that. And this trying, um, that is what is so great because you will have a completely new grasp of that technology. And um, you don't need to be afraid of failing. Uh, you, every time you try, you will learn something new on that front. And so I would say that the challenge is that fear and overcoming that fear. Um, and I think we have to do a lot to take that fear away from teachers, actually. Yeah. But we still have the teachers who are afraid to fail. They don't like to be failed. Uh, they never fail, let's say, or at least they think they never fail. And uh, <clears throat> now on the post-COVID period, they think that, thanks God, now it's over. We can breathe slowly <laughs> out and everyone into the classroom, I will show you uh, the new triangle. So um, uh, what we can do with them, uh, one possible way was the, also the kind of the, the tools or the, also the easy steps to how to follow to to be sure that nothing bad will happen or what it is how we can well help them this if they don't like to fail a very <laughs> difficult um, question because I myself uh, was a teacher for a short period of time like six seven months but that was enough for me to see um, how difficult it is to, let's say, fail or be human um, before the classroom, especially when it is you are a little young bit on the stage. People. You're a little bit on the stage. <laughs> yes, you are on the stage, and 
adults normally uh, understand that it's just part of the process. And OK, so you, you didn't do well, you will do it the next time. It's OK. But for students, um, especially younger ones or 15, 16 year olds, um, you are kind of the role model, or at least you're the teacher that is not supposed to fail in a way. And I, I do understand that pressure of um, thinking, well, is what I'm doing here today enough um, for them to, to really get away with that experience of, uh, of, of learning, right? And of also kind of understanding the teacher. Um, and so it is uh, very hard to shed those fears in a way. You can't just say like, oh, don't, don't worry. Um, so I guess it all starts before you go to the classroom. It is also about how um, the parents and also the ch children themselves learn these digital skills. So that when the moment comes, it's not only the teacher being there kind of like alone trying to explain something, but there's actually already a whole support network around it um, to kind of ease in the way. And uh, yeah, I guess that that's a big part of it too, that support for the teachers as well, and not only, yeah. Not only demands. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think, in my opinion, it's I agree with you absolutely. It's, it's difficult, but uh, they know that this door has been opened and it's not going to be closed anymore because you have your students demanding, your families and their families, so your families demanding also to this digital education. So I think one uh, one way to avoid this, this fear or to overcome this fear is these programs to train, to teach them, of course, to, to be aware that it's no problem when you fail. You have proved it. You have proved it when you are in pandemic that uh, this ends and you overcome this. So what happens? Yeah, so nothing, nothing bad really happens. Yes. Yeah. So the governments are, are now uh, aware with with the situation of training teachers of course there are many programs in the European European Commission to uh, create communities to train teachers to interchange the experience that uh, that uh, aids mm, it's a great thing to do this interchange this connection with in a, between teachers so I think we are on the way of course, it's difficult. By the way, a tip for all the <laughs> teachers looking, uh, watching right now. Um, you can also subscribe to the Digital Education Hub, yes. which yes. Uh, gives you some resources into, mm. uh, you know, digital education. And if you're a researcher as well, uh, like... Some guidelines, go some for, easy steps. Yes. Yes, Videos, and you can even talk with the experts in the hub. It's kind of like oh, that's a really link in for experts, let's call it. Mm. Yeah. One would think of this uh, situation is that we learn to learn with, digi with digital. So we, all of us, uh, learn how to seek the, 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 rec the resources, the look for anything who helps you to, to overcome this situation. And we learn. So now we have these this platforms, this community, and this helps really to us. So in the same way, our students learn to how to do just watch in a video <laughs> to uh, learn how to make a, an integral or something. No, it's the same for us as teachers. We, we learn how to, to look for this, this help. So we have to use it now. And, and this these communities can help. These yeah. communities yeah. can help. Just ask. Yes. Yeah. There are also companies that uh, are doing uh, this, like Microsoft uh, and many others in Google. This, who are the developers and can also answer yes. or yes. guide a person to closer to the answer. Yes. Uh, yeah. oh, by the way, about the businesses, mm, is the one question also. That how do you see the problem of accessibility in terms of digital education as a business? 
and as a need. Have human rights something to do with digital access? These are really the two different, these are, can be connected uh, questions, it can be also separated. So we can think about uh, digital education, business and human rights. What kind of connections you see between these uh, three fields? What is the was qu question um, uh, from the Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> so having an inclusive and quality education is one of the uh, UN charter, uh, well, uh, development goals, right? And so it is pretty clear to me that having this access to education is uh, paramount and it is a human right, or at least um, the definition should be human right. Um, and so digital education is just a means of having education or of giving education or however you want to, to say that. Um, Better accessibility sometimes, as um, you said also. And then this is another question, which is the accessibility to digital education tools, let's call it, like internet access or uh, robots or 3D printers, like Branko said before. Um, for instance, Branco has a super interesting project where they use 3D printers. Um, oh, that's how I will ask for the, for the next question from yeah. you. Be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it'll be that Branco, Branco, who, who, Branco. Already, who already sorry, went off stage. But um, so all of these tools are obviously expensive and difficult to come by. Um, but as we move further and further, further to this technological society, um, my hope is that we will have these access points everywhere, right? Like 5G, um, cheaper robots, and so on. And I think that's also why um, that this comes a little bit back to the question from before uh, about uh, the compet uh, competitiveness of our technology in the European Union. And so the European Union is focusing more, I would say, on this social, let's say, problematic of, of this and trying to, you know, have access everywhere. Um, whereas in other parts of the world, that's not maybe the primary reason. Um, and that's why I think that's also good that we have some mm, frameworks and regulations in place to kind of help us get there. And so that's, where I would say um, human rights and digital education connect. Um, it's not itself that, you know, access uh, to digital education, I would say, is a human right, but access to quality education is a human right. And because um, skills and everything is evolving, so digital education will become at some point also a human right, because quality education means the standard is filled for everyone getting that education to actually um, do something with it. So, yeah. I think that the digital tools uh, allows uh, accessibility in education, and that's that's really important. So we can connect to any student who is at here at the hospital and he, he or she can uh, attend the, the class with a robot, for example. A robot who is uh, engaged in the classroom, who is doing any, everything like the other students, but uh, this, this student at, here at the hospital uh, is the one who is managing the, the robot and attending the class and participating with, with, the, with the mates. Also, uh, as a teachers, we can use these, these tools. In the same way we are doing now, I can teach, for example, uh, when I have one project, uh, uh, we, I connect my students, pre-service teachers at university with a classroom, a real classroom with real children. And the children uh, shows the, these, these future teachers what they are doing, what is the, uh, their mathematical thinking, doing anything or playing with 
with mathematical games the my students at the university have created for them. So this is the digital education what, what allows to access to everyone. And this is great. This is a, a human right, as, as Luciano said. And really, the, Branco is not uh, with us in the <laughs> studio anymore. <laughs> he don't have the microphone. Uh, but um, uh, uh, this is... Uh, this, uh, and we, I can't uh, ask about 3G, but um, uh, 3D model. But, uh, uh, but I can ask from you that how you can make the mathematics uh, through the games, or yes. what kind of games these are that it can make the mathematics interesting? We need to know the mathematics if we think about the computer sciences sometimes. Yes, yes. Yeah. Even these uh, 3D models uh, helps a lot in in mathematics. Yes, the creativity, as we said uh, before, with the STEAM, with the A, we introduce in STEAM, but also because we make the mathematics real. We incorporate them to the real life because the, we made real <laughs> with this model or with the games. With the games, we can attract the attention of our children and we can uh, improve their mathematical thinking. I think uh, not everybody can understand this thing or can or are aware of, the, of this. But you see that uh, people say they have the shiny eyes and they are interested, yeah? Yes. Because they can see something really moves or something. Yes, this robotic connected. education. Yeah. Yes, really. Mm -hmm. The games they are playing at home can be adapted to to obtain a mathematical uh, uh, aware, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, prices or, or what you can. So uh, mathematics can can be really really improved with the technology. We can think in uh, Karl Gauss is, um, you know, the mathematic uh, for my, the best, in my opinion. Well, wh how can it live now with these tools, with its chat GPT, or with um, these many uh, automatic calculus uh, tools we have now? Did do uh, they were he was sitting like is no he was using that. He, he will, they need sorry. to use, they yay, need to yay. understand, they need to that. visualize it. He will, yeah. um, yes, and imagine, then. imagine the, the, the results he, ob he will obtain with, he, with these tools. So we, are, we have to do it, it's not, it's not our uh, obligation with, with our students to use it, to improve, in order to improve, to make them, uh, their knowledge in mathematics um, improve and also, of course, to, to Overcome this this fear they have they they have to mathematics education they always are like no it's not for me I don't like mathematics why why it's the, it's the same game you use at home but we can we can use it in in mathematics why not so this thing the, to make the mathematics real for them in their lives is, is really important and uh, uh, with this purpose, uh, uh, technology, digital education is really important. So that grabs the attention. Uh, Luciano, you have the last word because uh, we have some 30, 40 seconds uh, t uh, time left and <laughs> you can uh, just tell them what was the most thing you got from the hackathon, why need people need to, uh, uh, need to join the hackathon. <laughs> floor is yours. So, uh, first of all, and, and this is touching on what uh, Piedad just said, mm. is uh, you have to uh, become one with the reality of the problem, right? And so, once you find a challenge that is really a real problem in the world, um, you automatically will be uh, thrilled to solve that challenge, right? And um, this is actually what um, problem-based learning is about. And why it is so effective and it is because it gives you already an intrinsic motivation and then if you have a story um, that goes along with that uh, let's say challenge then your motivation will be even bigger and so in a way um, that's more than enough to participate which is you're trying to solve a challenge um, for a lot of people and this is very very powerful and it also connects you a lot with other people. And so, for instance, today I'm here 
because I won this Digi Edu hack. Um, and uh, today I'm a researcher because I won this Digi Edu hack. And there's a lot of things that come out of that. But it has mostly to do with that uh, perception of reality of that problem. You're trying to address that challenge. And in doing so, you are automatically uh, you know, progressing on your own way as well. So if you see it like that and not as, well, let's win a hackathon and let's see what happens uh, with the prize money or something, um, that's the wrong way to see this. This is about the road that leads you to, you know, solving that challenge and everything that happens in that road. And so I would say that's my message to anyone um, watching and considering uh, joining uh, the hackathon, which is, um, this is really an opportunity to shape your own uh, learning and career path in a way. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a good way to get started with all of that experience um, or startups, for instance. Um, and then maybe also a word to potential hosts. Um, this is also really great because then you get all this community together that is really trying to solve a challenge that normally the host is posing. Um, and so you have this immense value in this community that you are creating. And so please, if you're a potential host um, listening in, um, consider joining because this could be the single uh, new point of, uh, you know, a beautiful new tree that comes out of there uh, and, uh, you know, creates this awesome community of people doing and maybe some accelerator comes out of it or some new research initiative. So uh, think about it and um, I hope to see you soon in the Digi yeah, Don't hesitate to try. Thank you, dear uh, viewers. Thank you, dear guests. Hope to see you soon and uh, wish you the very best for the summer and see you already in the autumn.